Hi guys, uh, my name is Katie Patterson and I am a senior account manager here at IF. Um, welcome to my very first Serious Social Live. Apologies if you joined me last week. Um, we weren't there, there were connection issues. Um, and when I say there were connection issues, I mean, I had connection issues. So um, today we're gonna be redoing it. Um, I am joined by my friend and former client, Lois Engstrand. She is the Senior Global Marketing Manager at Clause Match, which is a fast growing FinTech based here in the UK. Um, so Lois and I are going to sit down to talk about um, starting a bit, uh, marketing department from scratch. So everything from brand to budget to um, stakeholder involvement to working with agencies and essentially um, everything we can fit into a 30 minute time slot. So let me add Lois to the stream. Lois, welcome. How are you? Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm good. Thank you. I'm almost losing my voice over here. <laughs> thank you so uh, much for, for having me on. Thanks for joining me and thank you for rescheduling to this week. Um, <laughs> no worries. I'm, I'm glad to see that you, you have everything connected now. <laughs> yes, we are connected. Um, let's kick things off with just a quick introduction. Um, from you. So tell us about your role, um, about Clause Match, and about kind of top level the changes that you've um, seen since joining the team in 2016. Yes, sure. Uh, so I lead the marketing at Clause Match. And rightly, as you said, Clause Match is a fast growing fintech, regtech uh, company. Uh, we offer a soft software as a service platform for compliance teams. Uh, that currently do their policy management in a combination of Word, SharePoint, and Excel. So our platform gives you one place where you can edit your policies, collaborate, track any changes, and let those who need to approve it do that, while keeping all the policies gathered in one portal for employees to read and attest to. So I started working with Clause Match back in 2016, uh, and back then we were about 30 people. Uh, our marketing was a couple of brochures and social media accounts. Uh, so it wasn't much, but it was enough for us to get going and uh, improve those. Uh, so my background is actually in uh, design. And one of the main things uh, that you learn uh, when doing design is the importance of being consistent and have clear branding um, when you start out. And that's literally what we started out doing, working closely with the design team, making sure that if it was a presentation or you saw um, a presentation at an event or a social media banner or a brochure, you would recognize it was the close match colors, it was the close match font, um, the whole look and feel had uh, the close match um, style to it. So that's where we, we literally started out before we, we went into um, working on our brand awareness by attending industry events, um, speaking, um, having um, a booth there. And then eventually we started doing our own events, which uh, I know you attended as well. Uh, you met a lovely magician. <laughs> no business being at a reg tech event, but I went to yours. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so everything was pretty much ad hoc uh, in the beginning, yeah. which I think is is quite normal until, until you figure out your, your ground and, and what you want to be doing. Um, today, as a team um, or as a company, we have doubled in size. So there's many, many more of us. Uh, and we're expecting to grow even more by the end of this year. Uh, we already got over 170,000 users uh, of our platform uh, globally across uh, wow. different regulated industries. So it's, it's in a very exciting time um, to be uh, working with uh, Close Match. Uh, and our marketing, which is what I like to call a marketing machine, uh, is properly set up uh, and running. We run lead gen campaigns. We do outbound and account-based marketing. Um, at, now we're at the stage where, uh, which I quite enjoy, is where we're, we're actually analyzing more the buyer's behavior. So when they're at the research stage or consideration stage, um, are we sure that we're giving them enough content, enough activities for them to be sure that they're now uh, ready to, to, to get a solution and, and talk further with, um, with sales? Uh, and I want to believe that um, every touch point that you guys might have with Clause Match now, whether it's an email or it's a call with sales, or if you visit, visit our website, um, you instantly recognize that it is Clause Match and it's clearer the value um, that we bring to you. Yeah, when you and I worked together um, at my former agency, um, we kind of worked together at that developing the brand phase. Yeah. Um, so what something that interests me about startups is the fact that you're kind of starting with a blank canvas um, and you can kind of go in any direction. That said, 
your product and offering is quite technical and quite specific. Yeah. So how did you um, develop your consistent brand and feel while also explaining the product? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I like the way that you explain it with having a blank canvas. I think going again back to the, the design phase, you always want to have a brief and some some boundaries or restrictions in order to be creative, in order to, to, um, to yeah, uh, make something. Um, so my short answer to this would be um, trying to understand your buyer and the journey, understanding the, the problems that they have and, the, and where they are at. Um, so uh, we are a startup, we are very innovative in, in terms of the new technology that we bring in, and we are changing the way policy managers are managing uh, the policies at the moment. And with this comes um, companies that are early adopters, they want to, to get into the new tech. They're not that hard to, to message to, and they'll probably read up on the, the tech and product. They'll be, they'll be um, ready for that information earlier. Whereas mm -hmm. the majority of companies in finance, which we all know adapt to tech quite slower or quite slow, they'll need much more um, uh, messaging and information that meets them um, before you start talking about the product. So more about, more about the problem that they're facing every single day. Um, so I think the importance of us understanding the industry and understanding the problems that they're facing at the moment, I think that's that's vital. Um, so for me, for instance, um, the reason that I wanted to join uh, Close Match and work with them is because of the product, because I believed it and I had an issue with um, with working um, uh, similar to the to the compliance officers have working on on documents. So I believed in the vision of the compliance uh, or not compliance officer, but our um, CEO and our founder. Um, and the issue that I had was that I worked in um, financial PR, I uh, worked with uh, a large FTSE, three, FTSE 350 companies and um, uh, companies that were going up IPO. And to work on press releases with them, it's tens of people trying to get this press release together. And I was the pers person gathering all the, the different comments and changes. And you can imagine you're working on version number seven and then Sarah comes back to you. She wants to change on version number two. And then Bob comes back and makes a change on version number five. It's um, literally a bit of a mess to get that all together. And once you get the final version, you then send it off to the three people who are gonna approve it. And then Tom comes back and says, hold on, why did we change paragraph three? And who did that? And I have to go through the whole email trail trying to figure out who said what and when and how. Um, it's it's quite mundane task and, and quite um, stressful in many ways. And if I had a tool that's close match, I would have one place, all the comments would be on the right hand side. We would all be working on one version and the people that had to approve it we could do that in one single document. I just, I understood the pain on a mm. small scale. This is a press release. Exactly. We could yeah. just <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So imagine yeah. that pain on, on for regulated industries, the, yeah. the, the, if you do something wrong there, it has a much greater impact than if you have something written wrong in a press release. So I think coming from that angle and, and again, understanding the audience that you're trying to, to um, offer the solution to, I think it's vital to understand um, their pain and then create a message and a story that they can relate to and then they can, can follow on the journey. Uh, and again, being with that, when you have, have that sorted, you also need to be consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, we had an issue early on uh, where sales would be calling the prospects, um, talking with them, and they would, of course, ask, can we look at the website? And they, of course, send them the link to the website. They go and look at the website. Sales then either didn't hear from them, so they contacted them later, or they would get an email saying, I'm confused because I just spoke to you. I got really excited. I went on the website and I don't really understand. I don't know what your product does. Yeah. What it, what it does. So it didn't matter how many leads we got in. At some point of that stage, people would lose out almost because the message wasn't consistent. Yeah. So I think understanding your audience the whole way because that, that changes as, as um, you grow and understand more and making sure um, that um, you keep consistency across any, any channel that you use. So for our side, uh, besides moving from ad hoc to more a strategic approach, uh, we have proper frameworks in, in place, understanding the journey, as I said, having a clear message, be consistent. Um, it, it's had loads of impact on our brand awareness, but also our, our lead gen. Yeah, I definitely have seen your guys has consistently come out in your marketing material. Obviously, you and I worked together at the beginning, and now I kind of I understand the product, but I also, it's a very much a well-oiled machine. Um, 
and I understand the different kind of pockets that the technology addresses. Um, I would imagine at the beginning, however, you were working with quite a small group of people. And of that group of people, you know, it was the founder and a lot of people that started the started the product. So they would, I would imagine they'd be very invested in how you communicate the product with your audiences. So how did you take their buy-in, but then also push along your marketing activities and create that succinct one kind of message and consistency across across the website, like you, you just you mentioned? Yeah, I think um, out of everything, I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges uh, I've faced and probably the uh, steepest and longest growth curve I've been on <laughs> <laughs> the past few years. Um, it's, it's a good one, though. Uh, and definitely, if we cover the, the when someone's a, a founder of the product, uh, and I've, I advise different founders um, on marketing, and the same thing um, I see over and over again because it's the product is their baby, it's their yeah. vision, and and they can see more than than usually I can because they they know it all, they know or know how they want it to be. Um, so the the challenges with um, or that can be with both working with people that are that close to the product. And also working in a, in a startup, uh, as I said, when we were only 30 people, startups hire clever people that, that are smart in the in the department that they work in, right? They, they, they're experts on that. But they're also quite opinionated usually, uh, and especially on the product and the marketing, which I think is not a negative thing, it's a good thing. If you can manage it, it has to be managed um, well. So it's one thing is having all the different opinions and then you have the other side, which I'm sure uh, you know as well from, from uh, your experience, is sales and marketing that don't necessarily work very well together. Logically, they, they should, because we're yeah. trying to achieve the same. But for some reason, in, in practice, we, we tend to not. Yeah. Um, and you need, you need sales with you on the journey, because sales are going to be using the content at the end, right? You need, you need their buy-in. Um, and the same with the CEO, so it's or founder. It's 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 building that trust with them and learning their strengths and when to have their input um, on mm -hmm. that journey. When when you um, create the content or you do the activity or or even working on the messaging, which we worked with with you on um, all the way back then, um, it's um, it's definitely a, a challenging um, element. But I think if you can learn to manage it and definitely include them. Because uh, they yeah. have lots of insights, they they know the market, um, um, and finding a way to to understand how to use that best way, um, I think it's it can be gold. Yeah, definitely. Like that, a lot of what you're saying rings true um, in the agency world. You know, we're brought on a project or a retainer for, uh, but we aren't the ones that are living and breathing the product every day and trying to sell in the product. So it's our yeah. job to know when to bring those stakeholders in because they're the ones that know the messages and it's our job to just kind of facilitate them. But it's an art because you have to bring them along, but then also understand the bigger picture and what your objectives are and kind of keep the ship moving. So exactly. Yeah. When you and I worked together at cause match, it was figuring out what that machine looked like. So yeah. It and it's a, I think it's a nice thing once you, you figure it out and you'll always be, cause you can work, we can use it in many different settings. It's, is learning to be more to, to be open minded, taking other people's ideas, but also understanding that at the end of the day, for my case, I it's I need to stand for what marketing does, and if it goes wrong, I need to be able to stand by that, and if it's successful, I'll share it with everyone else. Um, mm -hmm. But you need to to trust that you know what's best for marketing, and then you take on their ideas and, and try to to um, feed that input in, uh, which I think is what makes our activities different from others. Because you get yeah. input from people that our competitors don't have that that those people or those ideas, um, so I think it's very valuable to to bring them in on the journey, but but also manage it um, as you go. Yeah, use your experts. Yeah. Um, something else um, that I wanted to ask about was budget. Um, I would imagine your budget has fluctuated, probably gone up some years, gone down <laughs> some years, and you likely didn't start with much at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Your and team marketing kind of is known to not always get the most the biggest piece of the budget um so how did you what workarounds did you did you do when you when budget was an issue and where have you seen kind of your biggest successes of doing more with less yeah so budget is always an interesting one 
And as you say, uh, marketing is also when it when it's tough times. Marketing is the budget that gets cut first. Yeah. Um, and I, one a good element of that is actually the when you have less, I find that you can be a bit more creative uh, with what you do, which which is a, a nice challenge. Um, but also in the beginning, yeah, we didn't have much at all. Um, and what we did is that we leverage um, uh, our in-house experts as much as possible. So because everyone that works in the team, they know the industry. <clears throat> There's a lot of knowledge there. We have some great speakers. Um, so involving them on the content, but also some of the execution would allow us to do a lot of uh, activities for free because we were able to do that in-house. We have in-house designers um, and uh, our website we run ourselves. Um, loads, uh, or a lot of those elements would would normally or could many times be outsourced, but we managed to do a lot of it in-house, which I think has saved us uh, for some of the costs. Uh, but also in terms of when we're doing industry events, um, uh, I learned the art of negotiating, which uh, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, I can't say uh, was like my my strongest skill in the beginning. But you learn as you go, and then it does it does um, it does uh, help. And also building relations, it's it's interesting how much if you ask for help from people, how much they will actually help you for free. Um, yeah. I think again, building relations internally but also externally. Uh, can help you um, get a long way um, and in terms of activities it's very easy to think and to want because I've I've done that myself that you need to do everything um, yeah. people are doing paid advertisement they're doing lead gen they're doing account base they're doing all these different activities and you don't necessarily have to do that to get in leads or to get your brand awareness in so what we did in the beginning was that we focused on our events uh, of course that was our, our main main thing and we built the majority of our activities around that. So there would be blog posts leading up to it, blog posts following it, um, creating key takeaway uh, presentations or social media banners with quotes. Leverage one activity as much as you can. So I would I would recommend do do less, but perfect them as you go and improve them. And you can reach quite far by spending, um, not having to spend everywhere, not knowing what's working and, and what's not. And once you do more, you will learn what works and then you can spend the money wisely um, where it works, but also in the different gaps where you see that you need um, um, help. So for instance, uh, we had great content, but then we saw we weren't getting many more or it was the same people uh, looking at it, for instance, then you could spend money or it would be worth spending money on the reach. So work with an organization that has an audience that is your target audience, they have the credibility. I would work on maybe a ebook or something with them or project with them and then you will get the the audience into the good content that you already created um yeah. and i think of course we haven't done it perfectly but if if you look at our website traffic that's doubled every year um wow. so organically we've grown um uh, really well so it's part of what we've done has has um, clearly worked uh in terms of success uh, stories i think so as i said again we, we used to do the events so we had 2020 lined up with our event calendar. It was all looking bright and cherry and magician was coming and everything was good. <laughs> the magician, I remember him. Magician was coming. <laughs> uh, and then the pandemic hit and lockdown hit yeah. and we couldn't do them anymore. And we had never done webinars for close match before. Like we we hadn't tried that out. We attended some, but we hadn't done our own. Um, so we had to uh, quickly um, make a turnaround. And then in a couple of weeks, we had a, a series of webinars going um and that turned out to be a massive return on investment it's not that much money that goes goes into um doing them uh but the leads that we've generated from it is is very good uh, and i think there again it goes back to what i said uh, about perfecting what you're doing uh, for a webinar make sure that the topic is a topic that the industry is interested in and it's something that they can't necessarily get the information from everywhere and uh, mm -hmm. make sure that you get uh, speakers in that that um, might not have the same opinion on something so you get a, a good discussion so the value that someone attends the webinar they, they do get value out from it and they feel they're walking away having learned something or, or thinking about something um, that's more valuable for them um, yeah do you think you'll go um, back to events because I know like you said and what like I remember that's kind of how you built your reputation reputation and um, brand awareness was on the fact that you guys were the event people in the reg tech industry. Um, but seeing as you guys have had success with the same success with um, 
moving online, do you think you'll go back to being kind of that, 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 that position in the industry? That's a very good uh, question. I think, um, I think a lot of people would want to go back to events because we just want to see each other again and network however way we can do that. Uh, but then you also have, as you said, you have the return on investment. It's much cheaper to do a webinar. Um, so I think on that one, again, going back to what I've kept on saying today is, is um, we have to look at how the audience uh, is behaving. If they really, if, we, if we're going to meet them at our live events or our offline events, then that's where we have to be. Uh, if they prefer to be on the or, or at home in the kitchen watching watching us there, then then we have to be there. So I don't think it's a either or. We just need to see what what happens. Yeah, I kind of just personally think that there'll be like a surge in events and everybody wanting to go to every event they're invited to just to see people. Yeah, I can't wait. Well, I'm ready to go. Wait, yeah, I know. I'm coming to a Raytech event. Um, <laughs> yeah. But then, but then we'll kind of slip back into efficiency and being like, I can get the value, the same value from home and I don't have to go across town. So kind of the novelty will wear off. So it'll yeah. be interesting to see what happens um, in that space. Yeah, um, something that I love that you said that's very similar to social is that taking one piece of content and really spreading it across and really milking the value of it. Yeah. So taking, you know, a brand video and, repurposing it in a different way, writing a blog post explaining why you made that brand video. And that's definitely what you guys, I've seen you guys do with your events. And, uh, and we learned, uh, so when we, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no. <laughs> uh, I was just thinking when we worked with you, um, we learned a lot of that from from working with you guys and the framework that you guys put up. And I think that's a that's one of the the nice things when you when you invest in working with an agency is that one thing is you get the the help on board, but it's also you can you learn from from working together and you can apply that forward uh, forever. Yeah. Well, that leads me into my last kind of section is working with agencies. So, yeah. and you can you can be honest. I know we used to know each other from an agency client um, relationship, but what what benefits and pitfalls do you see as a brand working with an agency? You've already mentioned um, one of the benefits, but um, and when is it time to bring one on board? So from the client client perspective. Yeah, uh, so agencies, I worked at quite a few different agencies and freelancers, uh, and I've always heard like quite love and hate for agencies, which I always yeah. found, found uh, interesting. Um, I definitely don't hate working with agencies. <laughs> I think, it's, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very, um, very, very helpful. Um, but again, it needs to be be managed right. And I think that's with, with any project you work on or any people you work with. It's having clear goals and what you want to achieve um, and then making sure that you, you set up how you want to achieve that and you check in, communicate and measure where you're at if, if, you're, if you're getting there or not. I think that's one of the main pitfalls uh, that I've heard um, from others or that, that seems to hear over and over again is that they didn't from the beginning set out clear goals on, and they were aligned on what, what this is the outcome that we want to try and reach. Uh, and it's very hard to go back and then try to measure what went wrong and not if you hadn't put any mm -hmm. to measure, measure towards. Um, but I think bringing in agencies, like we did after we did our first branding session, that was visually. Then we realized, okay, we actually have to do something with our messaging because people were landed on our website and they were like, what on earth are you guys doing? Um, I don't understand. So there we, we figured, okay, we have to bring in expertise on, on that. And the good thing working with agencies is that you don't just get one mind on board, you get several minds on board. And you guys work with different companies that are across different industries. There's, the frameworks might be the same in a large company or small company in terms of marketing activities, but the ideas and knowledge that you guys have comes from different ways of doing it and then you can apply it to different industries i think that's it's a it's a great hub of knowledge and a great way to learn and then also uh because i remember one of the first uh, meetings we had because uh, i was only one person working in marketing right and the others don't have that education or that experience they don't understand how that whole journey works yeah and i remember i was doing the brainstorm and i was like oh this is amazing they get it. Like we can talk about this, and then we can be thinking about okay, we could do this topic. Oh, we could do that for blog posts. Oh, we could do later on doing cut it down to these pieces. And it's just nice to have um, people that understand what you're trying to reach to, and and they understand that whole journey and getting that help 
um, on board. And and as I said again, um, that 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 can go with you forever in the future. I've learned pieces from you guys that I still use. Yeah, I think having someone else looking through that marketing lens. Yeah. And kind of, especially in B2B, I think sometimes people are so close to the product um, that you kind of need an outside person just to kind of see, oh, this is this is this point of the product is sticking with me. This message is sticking with me. And you coming from a background of marketing and relating it to your pain points that you experienced and then applying that to what the tool does and then also having the marketing lens through it. Um, it's just, you need to have kind of both views of that. You would, you won't be successful with not having the big broader scope, but then also not being, having the people that are in the details, really understanding kind of what the technology does. Um, so yeah. Exactly. I think that that's a very good point because you, you do get quite, um, I was going to say like tunnel visioned when you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're in the same every single mm-hmm. day. And then you get someone from the outside, they'd be like, oh, have you thought about this? And you go, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and as a marketer, it's so important to listen to the people that are in the tunnel vision because they're clearly so passionate about that 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 piece of the product. So it's your job to kind of see the bigger picture and fit it in into place into the whole kind of marketing journey. Um, so yeah, it's a very cohesive relationship. Yeah. So how have you found that working with different startups and and companies in terms of I mean I'm used to it because I, I work in this I've worked in this for a long time, but we can have talk about something today and then we go and have a creative sleep and then we wake <laughs> up and we're like, oh, we should be doing this instead. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like what you said about the sta- having stakeholder involvement. Um, the hardest part of working with a startup is the beginning, just understanding how people work. You and I worked really well together because we both value deadlines and structure and yeah. putting in place and looking at the big picture. So you, it's not always as easy as when you and I work together. Um, but really appreciating, you know, those those creative sleeps and knowing that it's a part of the process to get the best marketing campaign you can. Um, being from a client services role, you know, the motto obviously is the client is always right. And while it can be frustrating at times, it really is the truth because mm-hmm. like I said, they are passionate about their product and they know what their audience wants, they might just not know how to get that message to their audience. And we're kind of that middleman of like getting what they want from point A to point B. So yeah, it's it's not all it's definitely not a clear path. And it's definitely not always the easiest. But people at startups are, as you said, very intelligent, very passionate. So they're kind they're the most exciting to work with, I find. Yeah, it's it's uh it's nice because people always have some good ideas coming at you. Uh, yeah, and like they've been living and breathing this product for so long. It's just it's just really interesting. Um, okay, we actually have a qu- couple questions. Um, we have one um, priorities wise, which do you prefer, live slash digital event? This may have some sort of dilemma where startups began to learn and adapt to new norms, balancing both challenges for some. Not sure. So which, what are the benefits and pitfalls? We kind of touched on that. What are the benefits and pitfall, pitfalls of a live versus a digital event? Okay. And as we kind of enter and are we're out of this new normal and go back to a bit more of a um, normal way of business, how will you prioritize? Um, yeah, so I, I think um, well, benefits and pitfalls, the benefits of having an offline event is that you meet people face to face. Yeah. And we have a whole sales team that, like, all of us are there. We all get to connect. And, and that's, I think that's a high, um, the majority to why we were successful, successful with our events is because people enjoyed coming to them. One thing is to learn something. But then we had networking. We were hanging out with them. We had a magician that was making sure that they got to disappear and see something that they haven't seen before. Like, they would walk away having, having a good time and, and associate that with us. Uh, and I think that element, I don't think I can really be able to do that online. Uh, I think that's, that's really, really tricky because that's, that's human connection, right, face-to-face. Um, the good thing about doing the webinars is that if you mess it up, you could uh, always edit it. And, and yeah, you better believe this is gonna <laughs> cut up. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a lot of my parts are gonna get taken out. <laughs> 
Um, and yeah, in terms of pitfalls, um, well, webinars are cheaper. Yeah. They're much cheaper than an offline event. So then you have to value, okay, well, what are you getting out of it at the end in terms of the leads, but also the quality of them and the connection that you get, which is, I think, can be a hard one to measure, but, but I don't know, we'll, we'll have to see as we, we go. I can give you a better answer in a year. Or maybe yeah, <laughs> we'll do another session in a year. Okay, I think we are actually just hit time. So um, let's wrap up. Uh, thank you so much for joining thank me. You. And if anyone watching has the questions, just pop it in the comments and we, or reach out to us over social media and we will answer them for you. Okay, great. Well, happy Friday and have a good afternoon. Thank you, Katie. Thanks. Bye. Bye.